Very good. So we'll begin with another word of prayer. Lord, we want to thank you so much that we live in a free country where we're allowed to still to open up your holy word, to learn more of your ways and your will. We pray that we may not take any of these privileges for granted because someday they might be taken away from us. So thank you for this opportunity. We praise you and thank you in your worthy name, Lord. Amen. 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 So I call this sermon of Sanctuary Not Made with Hands. And this actually is fundamental belief number 24. So I've been doing fundamental beliefs of the church. And this is Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. Now this here is only a part of it. The thing is like super long. So I just had the first part there. We'll read that together. And if you're interested, you can go on the internet and read it all. But we're going to be covering most of the points in today's study. It says, there's a sanctuary in heaven, the true tabernacle that the Lord set up, and not humans. In it, Christ ministered in our behalf, on our behalf, making available to believers the benefits of his atoning sacrifice offered once for all on the cross. At his ascension, he was inaugurated as our great high priest and began his intercessory ministry, which is typified by the work of the high priest in the holy place of the earthly sanctuary. And I can tell you that's just the beginning of it. There's a whole lot more. But it's interesting. And the interesting thing about the sanctuary is this, is it's a theme that really runs all the way through the Bible, right from the beginning and all, runs all the way through all the way to the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot to it, there's a simplicity to it, but there's also a depth to uh, this teaching that, uh, that the more you study it, the more you realize that depth. But to begin with, I'd like to share with you a funny story of a guy who was drinking and driving and he was careless and he bumped into the car in front of him. So he's kind of a little intoxicated and in his most pompous manner, he strides up to the car in front of him and he says to the innocent driver, boy, are you in trouble? I'm a lawyer. The other driver says, no, you're in trouble. I'm a judge. <laughs> so today we're going to be looking at how Christ is our advocate, our lawyer, our judge, and also our great high priest. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews 2.17, it says, For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Jesus is our high priest, but he's not just any high priest. He is a merciful and faithful high priest. Now, mercy has to do with love. Jesus is our high priest that loves us with an everlasting love. And he became human so that he could bless us and minister to us like we learned today in our children's story. He understands our struggles. He understands when we fall. He understands when times when you don't have strength, you don't feel like you have the strength to get up out of bed because you feel tired or maybe you feel ashamed. And then you think of Jesus and maybe how you've let him down. And have you said, Lord, if you forgive me this time, I promise what? I'll never do it again, only to find you do it again and you've broken your promise again. And in those times when you feel a sense of desperation, a sense of need, a sense of aloneness and of lostness, you have to remember that we have a merciful high priest. And he's not only merciful, he's actually faithful. What do we mean by faithful? And that means he is able to keep his promises. 
What promises? He's promised, I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. I'm going to finish the work I've started in you till my coming day. And so we see in our high priest that he's a merciful and faithful one that keeps his promise. Now this imagery of Christ as a high priest comes from the Old Testament and the Old Testament tabernacle. The Lord told Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And in this sanctuary, they would have morning and evening sacrifices. The sanctuary was the center of the yearly feasts of the temple and of, the, and of their wilderness wandering. And everyone was invited to come and offer personal sacrifices there. Each service reminded the people of a coming Redeemer. The sanctuary was like the church in the wilderness. The sanctuary was an acted out parable of the plan of redemption. It was like a passion play of redemption. It was had types. Types are illustrations. So there was a type, and one day there would be an anti-type that would meet the type. It was meant to show the great love of God for humanity and his loving care for his people. Now I want you to imagine just for a moment that there's a man who's come home from work that day and he did some things that's supposed to be doing and he started drinking and he drank too much and as he drank he became violent and he goes home and he's he's abusive to his wife he's abusive to his children and in the morning he feels absolutely awful and he apologizes to his wife. He says, I'm sorry. I know I shouldn't be drinking. I'm sorry. I shouldn't be doing that. But please forgive me. And he asks his children, I'm sorry. I've been a bad example to you. Please forgive me. And I want to tell you, I plan to go to the sanctuary, the tabernacle, in the middle of the camp. And I'm going to bring the prescribed offering a lamb without spot or blemish, and I'm going to offer that lamb to tell the Lord that I am sorry that I've done what I've done, and I don't want to, to continue to act like that. And so he goes on his way to the sanctuary. Now, when you look at the pictures, like pictures like this that you've probably seen before, Aurora, give me just slightly more, a little more volume, just a little bit. If you look at it, it shows that the tents that were all around were actually quite close to the tabernacle, but that's not how it really was. In order to go from the end of the tent to the tabernacle, it was one mile away. And so here's our, our friend, we'll call him Benjamin. And here's Benjamin, he has his little lamb on a rope and he's walking down and everybody can see him because it was visible from everywhere. It was a humbling experience. And he comes there to the, to the sanctuary. He goes underneath the linen uh, veil that's there. And there a priest meets him. Before him is a large brass altar, the brazen altar. And he's led to the brazen altar. And there he is given a knife and he must slit the throat of that lamb. And he slits the throat and there's blood everywhere, there's blood on him and he's shaken up by it. And he thinks, is this what my sins have caused this innocent lamb to have to die? And the priest explains to him, this lamb cannot take away your sin. An animal cannot take away sins. This lamb is meant to teach you about the true lamb of God that will come someday and will give his life for you. And as you, by faith, you've slain this lamb, you're putting your faith in that sacrifice. 
the Lamb of God, that one day would take away the sins of the world. And so it was a, a wonderful acted out parable of what God would do for us. The symbolic lamb would meet its reality in our Lord Jesus Christ. The tabernacle in the wilderness was a sort of a understanding of the whole plan of redemption. Every part of it, from the beginning all the way to the end. You know, um, the tabernacle in the wilderness was 45 feet long, 15 feet wide. And the temple in Jerusalem was twice that. It was 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 45 feet high. And what's interesting is in the temple one, the angels were not small like in the ark that was still there, but they were actually 15 feet tall. And they stretched, their wings stretched from one end to the other. So the wing of one of the angels stretched from the tip of the most holy place to the tip of the other angel, and the other angel then was to the other side. And I think to myself, I wonder if angels are really probably closer to 15 feet tall than six feet tall. And all of that was prefigured in the sanctuary. The Bible says that the earthly tabernacle was a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. So each of them were made in a special way to typify things that God was doing in heaven and that Christ would do on the earth as well. The Bible says Christ is, hasn't entered into holy places made with hands, which are representations of the true. But when he went back up to heaven, he went into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Amen. So this was a copy, a type, of what it was like. Now, the heavenly sanctuary is much larger. As a matter of fact, it's actually all of heaven is the heavenly sanctuary. The Bible tells us that there's, the angels are there thousand times thousand, 10,000 times 10,000. That's a hundred million. Amen. They all fit in the heavenly sanctuary. So it's a very big place. In the sanctuary you have the Ark of the Covenant and that represented the government of God and the throne of God. The Ten Commandments were there. They represented that God's government is based on justice and law. But above the law of God was what was called the mercy seat. And that's where the high priest would sprinkle the blood on the Day of Atonement. We'll be looking at that in just a little bit. And so God's government is based on justice, but also on his mercy as well. And the Bible tells us that all of this were shadows of a greater reality. One of the interesting things is in the uh, Old Testament uh, system, the priests acted as mediators between the people and God. The high priest was, of course, the, the main one, but all of the priests, the priests of Levi's, were mediators. But in the new system, there's just one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And what does this mean? Is that we can go directly to God. We do not need human mediators today. We don't need a priest to pray for us. We can go directly to the throne of God. Thank you, God. The high priest, he had these priestly garments, and underneath that beautiful garment, there was a linen cloth that he used on the Day of Atonement, and you had the 12 stones that represented the uh, 12 tribes of Israel that he bore on his heart and on his shoulders. And that represented our high priest that bears us on his heart and on our 
on his shoulders as well. Now, the priestly family all had to come from the tribe of Levi. And the high priest had to be a descendant of Aaron. So only one tribe was involved in the sanctuary service. Another interesting thing about the sanctuary is that it explains what, how God works as far as judgment. And what we're going to be seeing is that judgment is in favor of God's people. There's a lot of people who are afraid of the last judgment. They're afraid that when their names come up, that they will be judged harshly. And in Daniel chapter 7, it talks about that. There you see a wonderful scene. It says that the Ancient of Days is there, and that all around him are millions of holy angels. And then a procession takes place where the Son of Man, that's Jesus' favorite title for himself, comes with the clouds of heaven. The clouds of heaven, I think that represents the angels. And they brought him near to the Ancient of Days, God the Father. And then it tells us that to him, that is to the Son of Man, to Jesus, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall never be destroyed. The interesting thing about Daniel 7 is this, is that there's a nasty little horn called, well, the little horn, that is menacing God's people, that is persecuting, trying to destroy them. And then you see this beautiful scene of the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man given dominion. And then in verse 22, I believe that's really the center of the whole Daniel 7, where it says this, until the Ancient of Days arrived and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for them to possess the kingdom. So judgment in favor of the saints. Who are the saints? That's you and me. We are God's saints. We are the people of God. You see, the enemy comes as the accuser of the brethren. The Bible says he accuses us day and night before God. But Jesus says, no, they've accepted me. My blood is sufficient. I have died for them. And I will give judgment in their favor. That's what Daniel chapter 7 teaches. That judgment is given in our favor. The heavenly sanctuary teaches us all kinds of lessons. For an example, it teaches us how God deals with the most serious problem in the universe. That's the problem of sin and evil. Many times people have come to me and they've said this. Now, pastor, you say that God is all-powerful and he's all-knowing. And you say that God is good. Now, if God is powerful, and if God is good, why does he allow sin to continue? Why did he allow sin to continue at all? If he's all-powerful, he should want to get rid of evil and prevent it. At least get rid of it. So tell me, how do you explain that? And you know, the sanctuary explains how God deals with evil. And he does so, first of all, it explains it through the cross. It says, he did this, the cross, to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God must be just, but he also wants to justify those who have faith. You see, God had a problem. The problem was this. He told Adam and Eve, the day you eat of the fruit, you shall what? Surely die. Or as the Hebrew says, die. dying, you will die. So this is the problem. The sentence was made. If you eat of the fruit, you're going to die. But God loves the transgressor. God loves the sinner. So how is he going to do this? 
The cross was the answer. He would take upon himself their guilt, their punishment. He would die in their place. The creator would become the redeemer. And as was brought out in Sabbath school, what a wonderful and tremendous sacrifice that was, that Jesus would become one with us. But Jesus died, and we're still being menaced by sin. There's sin all around us. The devil's on the loose. He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Jesus died. Why do we still have sin? And so the sanctuary explains that. And it does through the most solemn festival of the sanctuary, which is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Now, it's still celebrated by Jewish people today. Um, it's the only fast day in the Hebrew calendar. And after the Day of Atonement, it was a day of feasting. But the Day of Atonement, the people had to be contrite. They would all be outside of their tent. They would be kneeling down, reflecting over their life, and asking for God's forgiveness. And while they were doing that, the high priest, the only day that he was allowed to go into the most holy place, on that day, he took the blood of a goat. There were two goats. They cast lots, and one of them would be the sacrifice of the Lord, the Bible tells us. And then there was another goat. And so he would take the, the one that the lot fell on, and that goat he would slay as a sacrifice. He would take the warm blood of the sacrifice in a golden bowl. He would take the incense burner. And he would go into the most holy place. He would sprinkle seven times on the mercy seat. And the Bible says, because, because on this day atonement will be made for you, to clean, to cleanse you, then before the Lord you will be clean from all your sins. Amen. Afterwards, he would uh, he would have the linen clothes. He'd put on his royal robes once again. He would go before the people. The incense burner was laid to one side. He'd go before the people and he'd say, "All of you are clean. You've been cleansed. You're clean." The whole congregation, their sins forgiven. Wonderful, isn't it? Amen. But the next day would start again. And this went on year after year after year until the real sacrifice came. So here's the high priest. Uh, they show him here with his, his um, rich garments on, but when he went into the most holy place, he just had the linen before him. But there was another goat. The other goat was called the scapegoat. And on this goat, the, the sins of the congregation were also laid. And then that goat was taken out into the wilderness. Somebody would make sure and go behind that goat to make sure it didn't come back to the camp. And the Talmud tells us that when it got close to a precipice, <laughs> they helped it over the precipice, and it would die there. What did that represent? The scapegoat represented that the origin of evil actually came from <coughs> Satan himself. Amen, amen, amen. He was the one that originated evil, and he's the one who ultimately Evil will be done when he's thrown into the lake of fire. We know that Lucifer rebelled in heaven. He was an angel of light. And he rebelled against the govern government of God. And through that rebellion, he threw our world into rebellion as well. And one third of the holy angels. And the Bible tells us that one day, in Jesus' parable of the sheep and the goat, it says, then he will say to those on his left, the goats, 
depart from you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And that will be the end of sin, sorrow, and death. It will be no more. And so the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, was meant to teach that great lesson, that sin will ultimately be dealt with, it will be gone forever in the universe, and that's a very important lesson indeed. Amen. Now, what's interesting is Revelation 8.5 actually uses Day of Atonement uh, imagery to tell what happens in the last days. It says this, then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it to the earth. And there were peals of thunder and rumblings and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Here is a picture of judgment. The censer is thrown down. What does that mean? That the intercession is over. No more intercession. It's just a time of judgment. And then right after that, you have the seven last plagues. That takes place. So when Jesus finishes his work of intercession, when all the cases have been done with, when everyone has decided to be with the Lord or to be against him, it's like we learned today about Pilate, where the Lord strove with that man, tried to save him through his wife, tried to save him, but when he ultimately made his decision, his decision was made. And at the end of time, the same thing will happen. The angel, the Lord, will throw down the golden censer, meaning the intercession is over. Day of Atonement imagery. Hebrews 9 and 10 are the two great chapters that explain that the earthly tabernacle was a, just a type, a shadow of the real thing, but the real thing is so much better than the shadow. Why? Because in the ancient tabernacle, it was inaccessible to the people. Remember, only the Levites were allowed to minister. And only the high priest was allowed to go in once a year. So it was limited access. But now the Bible, because of Christ, it tells us that we have full access. The Bible tells us that when Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, representing that the ministry of the earthly sanctuary and temple was over. Amen. And now full access is given to us. And the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us that we can come boldly where? To the throne, to the throne of grace. Amen. We can come boldly before him because Jesus sacrificed has accomplished that. And what's interesting is that it tells us that he did it through his torn flesh. He himself is the temple. As Augustine said, he is the auto basilica, the temple in person. And when he tore his flesh, he tore that and brought access to all of us there. Also, the ministry in the Old Testament was external, not internal. Hebrews 9, 9 and 10 tells us this, that the sacrifice of the Old Testament could not clear the conscience or change the behavior. It was meant to help you see something beyond just the sacrifice, the coming Messiah, that he would come. And it is... And the real sacrifice, it's effective to deal with sin. The Bible says this, He didn't enter by the blood of goats and calves, but He entered the most holy place once for all by His own blood, thus secured eternal redemption for us. By His own blood, He brought that about. Jesus' death, it was voluntary. The animal sacrifice, the animal had no choice. It was going to die. The animal's blood was carried by the high priest into the Holy of Holies. But Jesus brought his own blood before the Father and said, Father, do you accept my sacrifice? And the Father said he did. The animal sacrifices were repeated over and over again. But Christ offered himself once 
for all time. And you know, that's what's wrong with the Mass, the Catholic Mass, because in the Catholic Mass, the priest continues to offer the sacrifice of Christ. And that is certainly not biblical, is it? Because Christ died once, not every Mass, once for all time for us. And finally, no animal sacrifice ever purchased eternal redemption. And because it's been purchased eternal redemption, we have assurance that if we have Christ, we have salvation full and complete. You don't get to heaven by your own merits. You don't get to heaven by whipping yourself like Martin Luther did, and you still see it in Catholic countries where on um, Easter, they are whipping themselves along the way in the Philippines and many other places. They do that. No, because his sacrifice was enough. It's given to us as a gift, given to us by grace. We could never earn it, and so he purchased it on our behalf. There was this woman who uh, was having an affair, and uh, finally she couldn't, the guilt was such that he could, she couldn't take it anymore, and she told her husband, you know what, I've been having an affair with, with a, a man, and it was a devastating thing, and she was crying, he was crying, and he said to her, well, I forgive you, I forgive you for what you've done, and I want to be married to you, all right. But some time went by, and as it turned out, she was still having the affair. Mm. And the husband found out about it, discovered it, and he said, but I forgave you. <laughs> and she said, so tell me, what did your precious forgiveness cost you? You see, there's something about guilt that has to be expiated, that has to be dealt with. That's why people slash themselves. Yeah. That's why people commit suicide, because they feel the sense of guilt is so big that they can't deal with it, and they grow crazy. There's people in, in mental institutions that their problem is guilt, guilt, and they don't know how to deal with that guilt. But if you have Christ, you can deal with the guilt. Why? Because he's expiated. His blood has taken away your sins. It wasn't for free. It was costly. That sacrifice was. It was a costly sacrifice. It says Hebrews 9.22, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. Now, I don't know if you've ever gotten blood on your clothing, but blood stains. Mm -hmm. But the blood of Christ cleanses us. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Why? Because the guilt has to be dealt with. Somebody's murdered your family, and after two or three years, the judge says, you know what, I think I'll let them out of jail. They seem pretty repentant to me. The family's going to say, uh-uh. No, no, do not let them out. We're suffering. He's going to have to suffer for his crimes, we're suffering out here. Isn't that how it works? Right. Wouldn't it be a, like a miscarriage of justice to let somebody like that just go free because the governor felt like he should be? No. And in the same way, it has to be dealt with. And that's why Jesus died on our behalf. Because sin had to be expiated. It had to be dealt with. And his blood does that for us. His ministry is final and complete. Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear the second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So think of all the things that the ancient sanctuary taught. One, it taught about the Lamb of God who would one day take away the sins of the world. That he would be a great high priest. And that he would be a high priest up in heaven. And he would minister on our behalf. We don't need to go to a priest to ask confession. We can go directly to Christ. And that we have an advocate with the Father. That's a lawyer, 
Jesus Christ the righteous at all times under all circumstances Jesus Christ is our righteousness our sanctification our advocate and our redemption Amen. he is both the lawyer the judge and the priest Amen. when you have Jesus you have the full package before you God loves you and he understands our struggles, weaknesses, and problems, doesn't he? Yes. He understands that many times we want to do right, but there's an accuser that tells us, no, the reason why your marriage failed is you're to blame. The reason why you have cancer is you're to blame. The reason why you're not saved is because you're to blame. That's the accuser. But we don't listen to him. Amen, amen. We listen to Jesus, our great high priest. <coughs> he ministers to us and in our behalf. The Bible says we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without amen. sin. Amen. He understands us, doesn't he? He sympathizes with us. He was a human being. He knows what it's like to live down here in enemy territory. There was this guy, excuse me just for a minute. <coughs> there was this guy who was, um, came to this intersection and he looked in one direction but forgot to look in the other. And there was a terrible car crash. Fortunately, nobody was hurt. But both cars were totaled. And he got out of the car. He knew that he had done wrong. He knew that it was his fault. But the police came, and they were yelling at him. The people that, that whose car he crashed, they were yelling and screaming at him. How could you be so irresponsible? How could you not be looking? And they were... He was just feeling terrible. He was thinking, and I already feel bad. I know I caused the accident. When all of a sudden, his older brother showed up. And his older brother was a very accomplished lawyer. His brother looked at him, gave him a hug, realized he was okay. And his brother said this, trust me, don't say not even one word. I'm going to defend you. I'm your older brother, and above that, I am your lawyer. <laughs> he took care of everything. That night when he went home, he told his father this. Now, now I know what it means to have a defense lawyer. Because I was feeling alone, incapable to say anything. Everyone was accusing me. And you don't know what a relief and even joy to see my brother at my side. He was cool calm and collected and I remained completely silent he did everything he had to do and my friends the good news is this we have an elder brother the Bible says in Hebrews 2 11 he's not ashamed to call us brothers Amen. he became one with us I was thinking to myself what would it be like if in order to help someone, I had to go and become part of a, a hated group of people, maybe who knows where, some group of people that have done wrong, maybe, uh, uh, well, I better not name anybody. <laughs> but, and I had to do that because that was the only way to help a certain individual. That's nothing in comparison to what Jesus has done for us. Becoming a human being. Becoming one with us. And now he will be a human for all eternity. Now he's still God. And he has all the prerogatives of God that never could be taken away from him. Impossible. But at the same time, he's a human being. Amen. What a sacrifice that he has made for us. He's our brother. He's our judge. 
and he's our great high priest. Do you believe it, my friends? Amen, amen and amen. We'll have a word of prayer. Dear Father, we want to thank you so much. I don't think we can really fully comprehend what you have done for us, the sacrifice you've made. That little lamb that was slain in the Old Testament time was pure and innocent. It hadn't done anything wrong, and yet it had to give its life. But Lord, above that, you hadn't done anything wrong. But it was the only way to save us, and so you came down and became one with us so that we could have eternal life through your name. And we are so grateful, Lord, that you have done for, that for us. And when we get to heaven, we're going to throw our crowns at your feet and really fully realize for the first time what it meant for you to give up your throne and become one with us. And not only that, dear Lord, I want to thank you that you still minister in heaven. You're watching out for us. The plan of redemption goes forward. You haven't forgotten about us. You care about us, each and every one of us. Help us to know this. Help us to believe this, especially in times of trouble. We ask these mercies in your name. And if you're in agreement, will you say amen? Amen. 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 I think this is our closing song, huh?